Everybody in your crew identifies as either Big Mac Burger, McNuggets, or McCrispy Sandwich. But you're the filet fish Sandwich all day. That crispy fish, that savory tartar sauce, that melty cheese, that pillowy bun. Yeah, you get it. Every time. And if you love the filet of fish right now you can catch two of the classics you love for just $6. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Have you ever gazed in wonder at the Great Pyramid? Have you marveled at the golden face of Tutankhamun? Or admired the delicate features of Queen Nefertiti? If you have, you'll probably like the History of Egypt podcast. Every week, we explore tales of this ancient culture. The History of Egypt is available wherever you get your podcasting fix. Come, let me introduce you to the world of ancient Egypt. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. We left our story in 145 BC, but I need to tell you a related story that began a century earlier. According to legend, the first royal fire was lit in 247 BC in the city of Asak or Arsak, located at the foot of a mountain range southeast of the Caspian Sea. According to at least one source, the name Arsak was connected to Artaxerxes, which may imply that the city had been founded, or at least named, for the earlier Persian king. If so, it gave what happened next the peculiar glow of destiny. The man who lit the fire that day took the throne name of Arsaces, the man from Arsak. And for the next five centuries, every king who followed him would have the exact same name, Arsaces, tying him to ancient Artaxerxes. And at the very end of that long line, when the final king was killed in battle, his opponent would have the exact same name, Artaxerxes, or in Middle Persian, Artashir. But that day was still far in the future. This was just the beginning, the elevation of a respected warrior to the role of tribal kingship. The people whom Arsaces now ruled were a Scythian tribe from Central Asia called the Parni. Decades earlier, at the time of Alexander the Great's invasion, the Parni lived in Transoxiana, the territory between the Oxus and Jaxartes rivers, now in modern Uzbekistan, as part of a tribal confederation known as the Dahe. And yes, I'll be posting a few maps to help keep everything straight. By 250 BC, the Dahade migrated west across the Oxus to the shores of the Caspian Sea, with the Parni settling in the region of Margiana. Margiana was a minor satrapy centered on the fortified oasis city of Margus, better known as Merv. But it stood between, and bordered on, two more significant regions. These were the old Persian satrapies of Baxtrix and Parthava, known to the Seleucids as Bactria and Parthia. For those of you not using the maps, when I say Parthia, you can think northeastern Iran, and when I say Bactria, you can think northern Afghanistan. As mentioned back in episode T1, in 246 BC, the Seleucid king Antiochus II was poisoned by one of his wives, leading to an Egyptian invasion and lots of general craziness. This western chaos was also the trigger for these same two satrapies, Bactria and Parthia, to chart a more independent path. Bactria was ruled by a Seleucid satrap named Diodotus, whose name meant gift of the god or gift of Zeus, 
while Parthia was ruled by a satrap named Andragoras. And whether they were recent arrivals or descendants of Alexander's troops, taking risks was clearly in their wheelhouse. Both men probably felt secure that the Seleucids couldn't really do very much. They may have also made an agreement to keep to their own affairs. But what the two men may not have realized was that a Scythian tribe sitting on their borders might be after more than plunder. According to historian Frank D. Holt, sometime in the late 240s BC, Arsaces led his Parni horse archers in an invasion of the province of Bactria. After a period of conflict lasting for some time, possibly years, the Bactrian satrap Diodotus was successful in driving them off. This was considered a major achievement, important enough for Bactrian coins to display a victory wreath. Though it's important to note that, as far as we can tell, Diodotus didn't use the occasion to claim a royal title. And what about Arsaces? Well, he just moved one territory over and launched an invasion of Parthia. And though the effort would take years, this time he'd have his victory. In the first phase, the Parni seized northern territories along the Atrek River Valley. Then, slowly but surely, they captured the rest of the province finally killing the satrap Andragoras in 238 BC. Either during this process or shortly after, Arsaces founded his first royal city. It was called Nisa, and, just like Arsoc, it lay at the foot of the Kopet Dag mountain range. It was the first true capital of the Parni tribe, or, as they'd soon be known, the Parthians. So, you've got two former Seleucid territories, Parthia and Bactria, that are now basically independent. And while they hoped the Seleucids would let them go, that really wasn't in the cards. There was imperial pride, of course, and the strong desire to maintain the borders established by Seleucus I. But beyond that, the region had a personal family connection. As you may recall, Seleucus I's main wife was Apama, daughter of the Sogdian warlord Spitamines, which made his son and successor Antiochus I half Sogdian. Sogdia bordered Bactria to the north, lying in modern Uzbekistan, and this family tie provided additional incentive to remain engaged in the region. As Holt points out, while Seleucus I was still alive, his son Antiochus was stationed in Bactria, issuing royal coinage, establishing or refounding cities, controlling the eastern satraps, and generally doing everything he could to keep the region Seleucid. But it's also true that during their own reigns, both Antiochus I and Antiochus II were too preoccupied with matters out west to devote much time to the east. It wasn't until around 233 that the latest Seleucid king, the 32-year-old Seleucus II, made plans to reclaim his wayward provinces. By this time, the Bactrian satrap Diodotus had died and been succeeded by his son, Diodotus II, who'd immediately proclaimed himself king. And it's possible that this move, along with the Parni conquest of Parthia, had finally convinced Seleucus II that matters had come to a head. Learning that Seleucus was coming east, Arsaces and Diodotus II decided to forge a defensive alliance one which left the Parthians free to confront the Seleucids head-on. According to the historian Justin, Arsaces won the ensuing conflict, and Seleucus was soon recalled to Asia by fresh troubles. Even more than the initial conquest, driving off a Seleucid king was a signal Parthian moment. 
According to Justin, the Parthians have ever since commemorated that day as being the start of their independence. In the aftermath, the Parthians decided to seize more western territory. The territory in question, just south of the Caspian, was called Varkana, or Wolfland, by the Persians, and Hyrcania by the Greeks. Its major city of Hecatompylos, or Many Gates, became a second Parthian capital. Justin notes that Arsaces spent the rest of his reign settling the affairs of Parthia, levying troops, building fortresses, and strengthening cities. And, one assumes, learning how to govern a mixed population of Persians and Macedonians. The coins he minted had nods to both cultures, while honoring his own Parni roots. Depicting Arsaces in traditional clothing, including a Scythian cap called a bashlik. By the time he died, around 217 BC, the Parthian kingdom was on solid footing. The fire he lit way back in Arsak would burn for centuries more. Upon his death, the throne passed to his son, Arsaces II. And, like any new king, he took the lay of the land. The most critical threat was from neighboring Bactria, where a man named Euthydemus had usurped the throne sometime in the mid-220s. Euthydemus also ruled Sogdia and Fragana, and had even initiated contact with China, though it was also likely that, soon enough, he'd return his gaze to the west. With both rulers looking to expand, the prospects for war were fairly high. But then the fates decided to throw both kings a curveball. In 212 BC, exactly a century after Seleucus I had inaugurated his conquest of Central Asia, his latest successor, Antiochus the Great, decided it was time for a redo. According to Justin, Antiochus came east with a force of 100,000 infantry and 20,000 cavalry. Which, yeah, that's pretty substantial. Defeated by the Seleucid king, Arsaces II was forced to surrender Hyrcania and pledge Antiochus his loyalty. But at least he wasn't alone. Euthydemus was forced to confront Antiochus at a major engagement on the Arius River, where the Bactrian king fielded 10,000 cavalry. According to Polybius, during the battle, Antiochus's horse was wounded and killed, and the king himself was struck through the mouth and lost some of his teeth. Despite this, Antiochus rallied his troops, and Euthydemus was forced to retreat to his fortified capital of Bactra. Euthydemus was a formidable opponent, and ended up weathering a two-year siege before finally agreeing to negotiate. He argued strenuously that he was no rebel, that he'd actually overthrown the rebel Deodotids and hinted ominously that ongoing conflict might invite more Scythian invasions. Antiochus eventually agreed to an alliance, to be sealed by a royal marriage, the hand of one of Antiochus's daughters for Euthydemus's son, Demetrius. Once Antiochus returned back west, Euthydemus decided to take out some aggression by invading Parthia and taking some provincial borderlands. Which might not have been too big of a deal, except the lands included both Arsak, where the Parthian royal fire still burned, and Nisa, where Arsaces I was buried. And yeah, like I've said before, that's gonna leave a mark. The next Parthian king, Arsaces III, is mainly known for raising ambitious sons. Their names were Phraates and Mithridates, 
and though they'd eventually take the throne as Arsaces the Fourth and Fifth, respectively, let's stick with their personal names. Elevated in 176 BC, Phraates turned his gaze to the east, where a king named Antimachus ruled in Bactria. And just so you know, Bactrian kings tend to go all crazy quilt after Euthydemus and his son Demetrius, so we don't really have much idea who Antimachus was. Anyway, seeing no sign of Bactrian weakness, Phraates decided to focus on recovering Hyrcania. Okay, so let's talk royal roads. Many of you were familiar with the Persian royal road, running from Susa near the Persian Gulf to Sardis in western Anatolia. But there was another royal road running off to the east that was equally important. In Seleucid times, the road began at Seleucia on the Tigris and passed northeast through the Zagros Mountains at the Behistun Pass to the ancient Median capital of Ecbatana. As historian John D. Granger notes, around Ecbatana were a cluster of cities meant to guard this portion of the road. And again, I'll post a map to help with this part. Around 400 miles east of Ecbatana, near modern Tehran, was the major city of Ragai. Just beyond Ragai lay the real prize, a long, narrow, and very strategic valley running just south of the Caspian Sea that was the main route for crossing from Media into Parthia. It was known as the Caspian Gates. And, just to foreshadow a bit, in decades to come, this transit corridor would be a major artery of the so-called Silk Road, allowing whoever controlled it to grow very rich by taxing whatever came through. As Granger notes, the Caspian Gates was one of the key strategic posts of the ancient world, and was thus inevitably heavily guarded. At the western end of the gates was a fortified place called Cherax, no doubt a guard post controlling access to the gates. East of the gates, which are around 10 miles long, the road ran through two more Greco-Macedonian cities. Apamea, the equivalent of Cherax at the eastern end of the pass, and 200 or so miles further west, Hecatompylos. These several cities were populated mainly by Iranians, but ruled as Greek cities by Greek inhabitants. They also contained garrisons of Seleucid soldiers. Hecatompylos had briefly been Parthian before Antiochus the Great had come out east, and Phraates' first action was likely reconquering the city. He then captured the fortress of Apamea that secured the Caspian Gates. After that, Phraates spent the next few years subduing a mountain tribe called the Mardi, who lived near the eastern end of the pass and were supposedly allied with the Seleucids. Once the Mardi were defeated and the pass secured, Phraates led the Parthian army through and captured the fortress of Cherax at the opposite end. He then apparently settled some Mardi there who were compelled to hold it for the Parthians. Ragai was the next logical step, but Ragai was a major Seleucid city. So an uneasy standoff developed, with Phraates in control of the gates, but reluctant to move into Media. This threat may have prompted Antiochus IV to march east in 165 only to die of an unknown disease in an obscure Alemian village. Phraates was slow and patient in laying the groundwork, but knew the decision to go big or go home was up to the next Parthian king. When he died in 165, he passed the throne to his brother, Mithridates. And remember when I said this series didn't have much in the way of legendary warriors? Well, you can scratch that when it comes to Mithridates. And you can also scratch it for another king, 
Because, according to the historian Justin, at around the same time that Mithridates began his reign in Parthia, Eucrates rose to power in Bactria. So, I could talk myself blue in the face about the Bactrian kingdom and the Indo-Greeks and Eucrates and Menander and all that beautiful craziness. And believe me, if you think Seleucid politics are complicated, try spending some time in contemporary India. But for this episode, I'm going to try to limit myself to just what's relevant to the Parthians. Or at least mostly. If you want to hear my stab at a full Bactrian Indo-Greek narrative, you can listen to Bloodline episode B24, The Yona Kings. I should also mention that the events of this period are very sparsely documented. So take most of what I'm about to say with a shaker or two of salt. We've already touched on the two main dynasties competing for power. The descendants of Diodotus, the satrap who'd first made Bactria independent, and the descendants of Euthydemus, who'd usurped the throne. In 165, Bactria was ruled by a king named Demetrius II. We're not really sure which dynasty he hailed from, but he apparently ruled over territories stretching from Bactria to western India, right next door. As hinted at by his nickname, King of the Indians, Demetrius II was mainly preoccupied with holding and expanding his Indian territories, which left his Bactrian territories somewhat vulnerable. Enter Eucrates. We know virtually nothing about his background. We can maybe rule out space alien or time traveler, but apart from that, we can't say much. Except he had no connection to either ruling dynasty and was obviously an experienced soldier. All we know is, around 165, he usurped the Bactrian throne. Taken as a sign of Bactrian weakness, the overthrow triggered wide-scale revolts in a half-dozen neighboring territories. An excerpt from the historian Justin tells us most of what we know. The Bactrians were troubled by endless wars. Exhausted by conflicts with the Sogdians, Eracosians, Drangians, Arians, and Indians, the Bactrians bled themselves dry. Eucrates nevertheless waged many wars with great valor. Although weakened by so much fighting, and besieged by Demetrius, king of the Indians, who commanded 60,000 troops, Eucrates, with only 300 soldiers, triumphed by continual sallies. And so, after five months, he freed himself from the siege and conquered India. The historian Strabo adds the related tidbit that the Parthians took away from Eucrates the satrapies of both Tereva and Esponius. So, that's a lot to unpack. But it sounds like Eucrates came to power on the strength of 300 troops, likely his personal bodyguard. After a period spent suppressing revolts, Demetrius II returned from India and besieged Eucrates for about five months with an army of 60,000. Like most Bactrian armies, it was likely composed of Greek phalangists, Bactrian, Sogdian, and Iranian cavalry, a few units of cataphracts, and a dusting of Indian war elephants. Eucrates probably holed up in Bactra, the same place Euthydemus had held out for years against the army of Antiochus the Great. He eventually managed to weather the siege and come out of things on top. But, as Strabo noted, during all these distractions, the Parthians took away two of his provinces. These were likely the territories holding the Parthian cities of Arsoc and Nisa lost to Euthydemus decades earlier, and securing their return was a triumph for Mithridates. The transfer was likely part of a peace treaty, 
Since afterwards, Eucrates felt secure enough on his western flank to wage campaigns into India. Mithridates, in turn, secured his eastern flank, which left him 100% free and clear to pursue his western ambitions. The timing of all this is difficult to nail down, but it's not unreasonable that an agreement was reached sometime in the mid-150s, after which both kings prepared to march off in opposite directions. In the most likely recreation, around 148, Mithridates led his army out of Hecatompylos through the Caspian Gates and into Media. Somewhere between Ragai and Ecbatana, he was confronted by the Seleucid governor of the upper satrapies, Cleomenes, who managed to secure a military victory. This was the conflict we noted at the very end of episode T5. We also noted that Mithridates was just warming up. The following year, 147, Mithridates returned to conquer Media including Ecbatana and the cluster of cities defending the royal road. It's unknown whether Seleucid forces were killed or surrendered or retreated to Babylonia. Regardless, once the region was secure, Mithridates continued west to the Behestun Pass. Keep in mind, this was all brand new territory to the Central Asian tribesmen. You can picture them gazing up in wonder at the Behistun inscription of Darius I, or pausing to smile at the pudgy Heracles recently carved by Cleomenes. But all that was just the preamble, and eventually the pass unfurled a vista of the vast Mesopotamian plain. Here Mithridates had the same view as the Gutians looking down on Akkad, or the Kassites viewing the wreckage of Babylon, or Cyrus the Great when he first saw the lands of Nabonidus. Ancient cities, enormous wealth, and the door to a larger world. A door Mithridates planned to step through, just maybe not quite yet. The first priority was securing media, which may have taken some time and effort. Justin, in a later context, describes Mithridates as being ruthless, and says the locals found the high-handedness of their new rulers difficult to bear. But Granger notes that if that really was Mithridates' style, he probably would have met stiffer resistance and more frequent revolts in the later territories he conquered. Remaining in media during 146, Mithridates likely heard reports of a Seleucid empire in civil war. It was pretty obvious no Seleucid army was gathering to march on the Behistun Pass, and pretty clear that any that did would be nowhere near full strength. The following year, 145, was the year that everything finally broke loose. Ptolemy's invasion, the end of the stalemate, and the deaths of two kings on the Enoparos River. And at about the same time, Mithridates got word of another significant death. For the past ten years, since establishing himself on the Bactrian throne, Eucrates had spent the bulk of his reign campaigning in neighboring India, first against Antimachus II, then against a king called Menander. And yes, I know it's a digression within a digression, but I can't not talk about Menander. Actually, from the perspective of the story of Cleopatra Thea, this is like a three levels deep Inception style digression. But don't worry, I've got Joseph Gordon Levitt on speed dial. Okay, so in terms of background, Menander hailed from Alexandria, which could be, you know, any of the 20 or so Alexandrias between Egypt and Sogdia. Regardless, by 155 BC, he controlled a sizable chunk of India, including the territories of Arachosia, Gandhara, and the western Punjab. 
And yes, I'll post another map. Over the next few years, Menander campaigned southward into Rajasthan and eastward along the Ganges River Valley. He even allied with two other kingdoms to sack and burn Pataliputra, capital of both the Mauryan and Shunga empires. So, another Macedonian conquering stuff. What's new? Well, I think what's most interesting to me about the Indo-Greeks, the common term for the Macedonians who ruled over parts of India, is that, like a lot of conquerors down through history, they didn't have the numbers to just impose themselves on the locals. Instead, they had to appeal to local sensibilities and cultivate local support. What makes this case particularly interesting is how drastically different the cultures were. I mean, this wasn't the Parni taking over Parthia or Rome conquering Macedon. It bore some similarity to the Seleucid conquest of Babylonia, but then Babylonia had been conquered so many times they could practically write a user's manual. That was very different from the Greek experience in India. These were peoples with radically different histories, religions, worldviews, geographic orientations, you name it. But despite the many significant challenges, all parties managed to bridge the gaps and reach an accommodation. And whether tactical, organic, or a mix of both, the result was a cultural melding. One obvious example is contemporary coinage. Indo-Greek coins typically show a bust of the king on the front, often wearing a distinctive Macedonian-style cavalry helmet, with his name and title in Greek. But the reverse typically shows either Hindu, Buddhist, or Zoroastrian imagery, with legends in the local scripts of Brahmi or Kuroshthi. In fact, the earliest known depiction of Indian deities, including Vishnu, Shiva, and Lakshmi, appear on Indo-Greek coins. The coins are often square in shape, of a distinctive Indian style. A more famous example of cultural melding is a work created around this time called the Melinda Panha, or The Questions of King Menander. The book is basically a long-form Q&A session with a Greek intellectual, in the form of King Menander, posing deep philosophical questions to a Buddhist sage named Nagasena. The work provides a rare glimpse into the Indo-Greek world, and suggests that Menander eventually converted to Buddhism. If so, because of the expansive territories he controlled, Menander likely contributed to the spread of Buddhism in Central Asia, something usually associated with the later Kushan Empire. In fact, the earliest statues of the Buddha, dated to between Menander's death and the 2nd century AD, were likely influenced by Hellenistic forms. Plutarch also notes that when Menander died, in respect to his remains, the cities put forth rival claims, and only with difficulty came to terms, agreeing that they should divide the ashes equally, and erect monuments to him in all their cities. These monuments were very likely Buddhist stupas. Religion aside, Menander was clearly a formidable warrior. Though King Eucrates of Bactria made numerous attempts to conquer and hold Indian territories, Menander consistently succeeded in driving him off. In later years, Eucrates campaigned with his son and co-ruler, Heliocles. Around 145, according to Justin, when Eucrates was returning to Bactria, he was killed along the way by his own son with whom he had shared the throne. The murderer made no effort to conceal the patricide, acting instead as though he had slain an enemy rather than his father. He drove a chariot in the victim's blood, 
and ordered the corpse to be cast aside, unburied. Chalk it up to ambition, a sharp dispute, or general bad parenting, that was pretty much it for Eucrates. Mithridates likely received the news while securing his Median territories. While war-ravaged Syria was a tempting target, the death of Eucrates meant, first, their peace treaty was null and void, and, second, Bactria was vulnerable. Vulnerable to Mithridates and his army, sure, but also vulnerable to steppe tribes invading from the north. Leaving his brother Bagassus behind to serve as Median viceroy, Mithridates gathered available forces and led them off to the east. <laughs> 